So this is maintaining a united house, and uh, the idea is not just uh, uh, the church house, but, you know, your home as well. So the church at Corinth was experiencing uh, several different kinds of problems, and uh, there in uh, verse 10 of uh, chapter 1, Paul begins to address one of the problems that was impacting, impacting the church in a negative way, and that was divisions. And obviously, when you have a, a church that's divided, that's never a good thing. Uh, Paul knew this was an issue that had to be resolved. And so Jesus himself taught in Luke eleven seventeen, but he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. Uh, maintaining a united house is going to require three things according to them. But let's talk a little bit about what divides a house. Let's, what divides a church? What, what are the things that causes division within the house of God? Um, anyone? Thoughts? Okay. Hard feelings. What else? What else? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> music. Uh, music, unfortunately, can be a big challenge in churches. Uh, seen certainly seen that in my, my time. Uh, matter of fact, music really intimidated me when I first became a pastor because I knew it was a problem. And at one time in uh, this town, I knew of, uh, I think it was five churches that were uh, facing a possible split because of music in their church. So, uh, yeah, it can, be, it can be rough. What else causes division? Difference in doc doctrinal okay. beliefs. All right, doctrinal beliefs. And, uh, and, and, and in some cases, listen, there's some doctrines that you don't waver on. Uh, you don't yield an inch with. Uh, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come unto the Father but by him. And so uh, there's no other way. And so there's, you don't yield any ground in regard to that doctrine. Um, you don't yield any ground in regard to the death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, so there's things that just are. And someone comes in here and they want to present a different uh, gospel. Uh, they, they can get saved or they can leave. So... Uh, I don't mean to be flippant about it, but uh, I've actually, through the years, actually have had people, not necessarily, uh, I mean, some difference in doctrine, uh, nothing too harsh, but just a disagreement in the direction, uh, wanted to tell me what to preach, when to preach, and how to preach it. And uh, I'm sorry, folks, but I just don't believe in that. I think that's between me and the Lord, and uh, I'm not, I don't claim to be the brightest bulb, but I'm a bulb that knows that, you know, any light I shine will be through the Holy Spirit. So uh, we're going to stick to that. So the number one thing they say is concentrate on Jesus. We have a tendency to think of New Testament churches as being ideal. Uh, they weren't because they were made up of imperfect people just like us. And you've heard the old saying, if you find a perfect church, church don't join it or it won't be perfect anymore. Uh, you know, I think that we tend to... Um, idolize or uh, mysticize, you know, the churches of the first, uh, uh, of the, uh, first century, uh, biblical figures. We, we don't really, uh, we think of them as like superhuman strength and all of these abilities. And uh, the truth is we're talking about, uh, I think we're talking about men that were, when I say hard, I mean their life was hard. They were hard. They were, uh, they certainly, I don't know that they'd have a lot of respect for what we consider hard in our world today. Uh, these are men that, uh, you know, either fishermen or work in the fields or uh, herding uh, sheep or whatever the case may be. Uh, they had a hard life. The women had a hard life. And so, uh, so no, they weren't, they weren't perfect. Uh, their, their lives weren't uh, easy by any stretch of the imagination. And they did not per, uh, possess not one ounce of more spirituality than the potential that we have. Uh, you know, they had the same issues that we have today. The church at Corinth uh, had many problems, and Paul begins to address this problem of divisions. And verse 10 says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. So it's, it's the will of God that, that there's not to be any divisions. Uh, let me go on a little, a little bit here. Um, 
so this is the 10th reference made to Jesus in 10 verses. So when we take our eyes off of Jesus, we start having the same problems that they begin to have in Corinth. Uh, in Hebrews 12, 2, we're told, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Um, our, our looking towards Jesus, what do you think Paul meant, um, uh, the author here meant by this, that we're looking towards Jesus? Um, what, did he, what did he intend for us to do? What does that mean, uh, to look towards Jesus? Anyone? Because Jesus is the example. I think we talked about it last week that uh, Jesus didn't just tell us, you know, to uh, endure suffering. He showed us at the cross. Uh, you know, Jesus didn't just tell us to love uh, our enemies. He, he showed us. He demonstrated it uh, in his life. And so, again, if we, if we truly would pay attention to what Jesus modeled before us, uh, it certainly would help us to be, I think, a little bit more conscious of being a worthy disciple. Uh, to solve any problem, we must first focus on looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, when we don't focus on Jesus, we become selfish and difficult at church as well as in our homes because we become more concerned uh, with ourselves than anyone else. This results in division, splits in the church, and divorces in the home. I just can't uh, say it enough, I don't think. You know, I think pride is probably the number one killer in our spiritual lives. Um, we, we allow ourselves, I don't know how to best word this. Christians very often are Christians right up to the very second they decide not to be a Christian. And what I mean by that, you know, they're getting angry, they're getting upset, and then they just let go. They said, all right, I've had enough. So what have you had enough of? You've had enough of being meek and mild like we're told to do? You've had enough of, 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 uh, of being humble, and so you're going to fly off the handle, uh, or you know we're just going to be combative or bitter or angry, whatever the case may be. And so we don't focus on what he taught us to do and taught us how to act. Uh, so we get right to that point, and we just we abandon ship. Um, it's like I say very often that we like to take Jesus and set him in the corner like a fire extinguisher. And when we get our life all burning, you know, from all directions, then we want to grab Jesus and say, hey, Lord, fix us, you know, fix all my problems. And, you know, when he blesses us, I mean, we're just like the children of Israel. Paul appeals in the name of Jesus that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. They were to speak the same thing regarding the basics of the faith. Genuine Christian unity is based upon the agreement with the fundamentals of the gospel as revealed in the Bible. To prevent divisions, we must believe the same thing about salvation by grace, the Bible, marriage, baptism, etc. This is how uh, in Jude 1, 3, this is what he said. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The word contend here means to continually and vigorously defend the basics of the faith as expressed in the Bible. In other words, don't back down. But in order not to back down, you got to know what you believe. And to know what you, got to, what you want to believe or what you should believe, uh, you've got to study the Bible. The word once here refers to something that is complete, valid, or never changes. So we're able to defend the faith and be perfectly joined together uh, in the same mind and in the same judgment in regard to the basics of the faith. So again, it's, it comes down to the knowing what you believe, being foundational, and, and being uh, having the, the, solid, uh, the solid foundation of the word. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to be carbon copies of each other. Lord, I'd hate to see that. It has been said we don't have to be twins to be brothers and sisters in Christ. I really like that quote. Um, but we've got to agree on the basics or there will be divisions in the church. Listen, there's going to be differences on, well, right now, everybody, you know, a lot of people are focusing on the rapture because of what's going on in the Middle East, you know, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-rap, all these different things. And... Uh, and it's interesting to me with the, all the reading I've been doing, uh, the different views on uh, these wars and when they will happen, how they'll happen, and all these things. And, uh, and really, two of the guys that I like listening to, they have pretty uh, different opinions about some things. But obviously, you know, they're not dogmatic about uh, things. Uh, some things, I don't know how people can be so dogmatic. They're future things, and, well, you know, we don't know the future. And so we just have to wait and see 
uh, how it's going to turn out. I'm not saying that we should be ignorant of the future. I don't believe that. And it's okay to have an opinion uh, about what you think is going to happen. But I don't think it's worthy of being divisive. So likewise, we must be respectful of views of others in regard to those doctrines that are not fully known or understood, the rapture, the tribulation, uh, Jesus' second coming. Now, I'm not saying that you that it's okay to say that there is no rapture, or there is no tribulation, or there is no second. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about the timing of these things, the order of these things. Um, those are things that uh, we won't know till they're here. So, uh, so to maintain a united house, uh, we've got to concentrate on Jesus and cultivate unity. Cultivate unity. That means we've got to work at it. We have to uh, take time and pay attention to what's going on around us. Paul had received a report from someone in the household of a woman named Chloe that there were contentions among the believers in the church. These quarrels were not about the basics of the faith, but about personalities. And verse 12 gives us you know, some insight here. 1 Corinthians 1, 12. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of uh, Cephas, and I of Christ. So there's four cliques in the church. There's the Paul followers, the Apollos followers, the Cephas or Peter clique, and those that follow Christ. And so what was going on? You know, evidently they were baptized by these uh, folks and, uh, or they just, you know, uh, aligned themselves in, in their thinking or whatever. And so they, they were having these different teams. And so, and I've seen that in churches where, uh, you know, maybe so-and-so, uh, you know, they align themselves with the pastor. Some others might align themselves with a senior deacon in the church or something like that. Uh, or maybe one thing that really uh, bothers me is when I hear about, you know, there'll be a young preacher hired to come into a church. And so you've hired a man of God to preach the word of God. And then the first thing you want to do is tell him, well, we don't do things like that here. And uh, too often those are coming out of the words of people in struggling churches, in dying churches. Uh, and so if you're gonna if you're gonna hire someone to be your pastor, then you need to support him. You need to follow him. I'm not saying you allow him to preach heresy, but as long as he's preaching the word, uh, he deserves your respect and, and his following. So while Paul, Apollos, and Peter were great servants of God, none of them promoted themselves to cause this kind of division in the church. Uh, the fourth click was the Christ click. Now at first you might think, well, okay, well that that makes sense. So I mean, who wouldn't want to be a Christ follower? But then you think about why would he include him in this list? There's divisions among you. And so I think this guy makes a, a, a pretty good point that maybe this crowd was spiritually arrogant. Maybe, uh, maybe they were not uh, being spiritually mature. They weren't being loving in, in their assertion. Paul may have included the clique of Christ on the list because they were a super spiritual clique who believed that they were spiritually superior to their brothers and sisters. There's a difference between believing that you are right and believing you are superior. Um, I mean, there's things that I think I'm right about, and there's other things I think, well, I, I think I get it, but I'm open to more study or whatever. Uh, but to believe that you're spiritually superior to people, uh, I know that it's very plain, it's very clear that different people are at different levels, if you will, of their spiritual walk with Christ. Uh, some people are great Bible readers and, and studiers, and, and so they have a good uh, knowledge of Scripture. And, and, but there's a difference between intellectual knowledge and spiritual knowledge. Uh, some people might be great prayer warriors. Uh, they have great faith that through prayer that God will move, and certainly we, we believe that. Uh, and there's just different, there's various ways that people uh, can be at a different level in their, in their Christian walk. Uh, but we don't want to be superior uh, in our thinking as far as, well, I'm way above you. Okay. Um, I think, what does it, the Bible say that God confounds the wise with the foolish things or uh, something? Yeah, I might not have the wording, but you get the point. Yeah, you know, think about, think about uh, Peter and, uh, and John and Andrew and James. Uh, these were, you know, fishermen. And what was said about them, they realized, you know, that they were ignorant and unlearned men. Uh, but yet, you know, their speech, their teaching, you know, had these guys, uh, you know, just fab, uh, flabbergasted. So uh, we all have someone who's special to us because they led us to the Lord or they helped us to grow spiritually. Mine is Brother Harold. 
led me to the Lord when I was 13, and he's just been a, an encouragement throughout my life. And so, uh, but, you know, uh, it's okay to have that special affection for someone, but um, unless that affection uh, causes division in the church, and then it becomes a sin. And so you don't want, and I really can't think of a good example off the top of my head about how we would be divided over, you know, like in this one or that one, unless there was some kind of problem uh, brewing in the church and uh, looking to maybe dismiss a, a deacon or an elder or something like that, uh, then you might have some division as far as that goes. Um, if you're a spiritual person who has been taught by a spiritual believer, you will bring unity to your church by obeying Paul's teaching in Ephesians 4.3. And so endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So endeavoring... It requires work, it requires effort, it requires uh, intentional um, actions, thoughts that sometimes, listen, people can be divided over the silliest things in the church. People can argue over the co color of paint, of carpet, of curtains, or whatever the case is, and they can allow that uh, to become very um, divisive. I know years ago we were getting ready to, to do this foyer out here and remodeled all this, and uh, I had three tiles up here to, so we could vote on it. And there was one lady, bless her heart, she stood there the entire time. Everybody that walked up was like, see this, this tile right here, that's, that's the one that looks the best. That's the one we need to go with, don't you think? And, you know, it's like, and I'm standing over here going, oh, my, please. But uh, so the third component that he mentioned here uh, is the fruit of the Spirit is peace. Believers filled with the Holy Spirit always promote peace and unity. And in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. And so it should be, it should be inherent to a believer uh, to want to have peace, certainly peace in God's house. Uh, I've tried to teach through the years that if so-and-so offends me, my first thought shouldn't be necessarily about getting even or being upset or whatever. Uh, if, it, if the person that has upset me is a, a professing Christian, I think my first question in my mind should be, do you really think that they, as a Christian, would intentionally try to hurt you? Was it intentional? Because through the years, I've seen so many uh, people hurt, disagreements and all this over misunderstandings. And more often than not, they don't go to one another. They don't get it worked out. But I would say probably, I'd say at least 95% of the ones who did go to their brother and sister to, to, to discuss what had happened, they get it worked out. And it's not, it's not divisive. It's not a problem. They get it worked out and they move on. Um, so it should be inherent in us to have that desire to have peace in God's house as well as in our homes or work or wherever the case may be. Uh, you know, Bible teaches us that, you know, as, as much as it's possible uh, under our control to live peaceably with other men. And so uh, we have, we, we are uh, bound to make that happen, uh, to do our best. Uh, if you want to maintain a, a united house, concentrate on Jesus, cultivate unity, and elevate others. Paul destroys the validity of following personalities by asking three rhetorical questions in verse 13. The first question he asks, is Christ divided? Does Christ want his church divided? No. And uh, our Lord said this over in John uh, 17, 22, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. Christ is not divided, and his spiritual followers shouldn't be either. Um, just because we have different views on things, doesn't mean that we should be divided. Um, far too often, I've seen people that have gone um, off the rail, if you will, over the most simple things. I've seen people misspeak and people get upset about it and, you know, and create this big schism and what have you. And so, again, uh, let's take the approach of, you know, would this person intentionally do something to hurt me to to upset the apple cart, so to speak. And so we need to, I know with me, I tend to, whenever I've got something going on, 
in the church with someone, the first thing I usually do is, okay, I look at me first. What did I do or what did I not do um, in order to either fester the problem or to be able to keep it from happening or whatever the case may be. Uh, but I really think that one of the first questions that we should ask is, would your brother or sister in Christ intentionally hurt you? Um, and then I think you go from there. Because I hope the answer to that question is no. I hope when we ask the question about, you know, would my brother offend me? Well, no, I don't think he would do that on purpose. I mean, I, there's no way I believe that John would uh, intentionally do something to, to hurt my feelings or to offend me. Uh, I don't believe he would. Uh, but if he did, you know, I'm going to say, hey, man, what's up with that? And, oh, well, you misunderstood me or whatever. Or, or I, I didn't mean you. I was talking about somebody else or whatever. But, uh, but that conversation has to take place so we can. The whole point of the conversation is to reconcile with your brother so that the body doesn't become divided. The body doesn't begin to break off. Um, Christ equips the church for its ministry. Every man, woman, and child that's here is here by God's will. And, and there's a purpose for them being here. There's, they're part of this body, and there's part, uh, a part of being there is what makes us strong, is what makes us uh, you know, formidable against uh, the world. Next, Paul says, was Paul, was Paul crucified for you? Well, obviously the answer is no. In the Great Commission, Jesus instructed us on how to evangelize. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And notice that Jesus says in the name, singular, not names. When you are asked what your full name is, you typically will give them your first, middle, and last name. So is that three names or is that one full name? God's full name is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. However, uh, the name that he revealed himself through to us is, is Jesus. So in the book of Acts, when people are being baptized in the name of the Trinity, God's name is somewhat abbreviated because then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we see back here, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. I will tell you right now, I have met people that if you don't baptize someone in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, they believe that that baptism isn't worth anything. You know, I've run into people that will say that, but what does he say right here? Um, uh, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. I had a lady one time that walked up on our driveway. I was out there one Saturday, you know, working on the car or something, and uh, this group from a church, and funny because they were like from Daytona or something, they were walking through the neighborhood, and she come up, and uh, she was tired, and so I had a chair there. I said, yeah, have a seat. And so we're talking, and she said, well, in whose name do you pray? I said, well, in the name of Jesus Christ. And she said, oh, well, that's the problem. <laughs> I said, no, ma'am, that's the solution. <laughs> but somehow she had it in her head that that was wrong. And so, uh, again, I mean, I didn't argue with her or nothing. I'm like, okay, um, there's just some people that, you know, I don't know if I told you last week or not, but I ran into a guy that told me that, a preacher in our town made a statement that, you know, knocked him. I think I told you the story. And I said, well, what was that? And he said, he said, God loves everybody. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> What's wrong with that? And about that time, a customer walked in. We got interrupted, didn't get to finish it. But his whole uh, basis of that statement is when the Bible says that, you know, that God uh, hated Esau. And so I'm like, dude, you need to go back and reread that and look up what that word means because it doesn't mean hate the way we look at it. It means to favor less. And uh, so it's not the same. But people, you know, get these things in their head. And so, but the disturbing thing to me is that there's someone out there teaching people that God doesn't love everybody. And so that really puts a damper on a lot of scripture there, you know, John 3, 16 and, and others. So, so the point is we don't follow people. We follow Jesus. And listen, I can tell you how devastating that is, that when people begin to uh, follow their pastor uh, and then that pastor has a failure, uh, how devastating that can be. I've got a sister that years ago we had a pastor here that uh, I don't know that he did anything 
uh, morally wrong. I don't believe he did, but uh, the truth is that uh, he ended up resigning, and when that took place, it just shattered her. It just broke her, and uh, she hasn't been living right since. And so uh, it really took the wind out of her sail, so to speak. But the point is, is that he's just a man. He's just a man. Um, we're, we're pastors are men with, with great responsibility, but we don't get the stamp of, of, of perfection uh, when God calls us. If anything, man, we got a lot, we got a big learning curve. I know I did. I'm still working on that curve. Um, so, again, we don't follow people. So, and to emphasize this, Paul writes he is thankful that he only baptized Crispus and Gaius. Crispus was the ruler of the synagogue at Corinth, and uh, his whole household believed and was baptized. And then Paul, having written his letter from, uh, to the Romans, was uh, written from Corinth. So we know that Gaius was the person in whose home that Paul stayed and that the church originally met there. Uh, so beside these two, Paul also remembers baptizing the household of Stephanus, uh, who were Paul's first converts in Acacia, and uh, a province of Greece, which Corinth was the capital. So Paul's not minimizing the importance of baptism. He's pointing out that he didn't personally baptize most of his converts, and that was done by his associates, probably Silas and Timothy and whomever. Uh, and even Jesus said to practice this, because in John 4, 2, we read that though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, and of course this was when you know, they were coming and saying, well, you know, this guy over here is baptizing more people than John and all this. And he said, well, you know, Jesus, though himself, did not personally baptize them. Um, so there's, um, there's a, a problem sometimes. Uh, people, listen, it's okay to have uh, heroes in, of the faith. Uh, I've known guys, you know, through the years and women that I admire. I admire them greatly. Uh, I don't I don't worship them, uh, and I'm, I know that they have flaws. So I've seen their flaws, but I really, really, really appreciate their intelligence and their and their godliness and their example. Uh, I don't know about you, but I like being around people that that challenge me to grow. Uh, and and I know that there's times where I'm supposed to be that person that's challenging other people to grow. But I also like to be challenged. I also want to grow. I want to be stretched and. Uh, because I do, I want to be a better Christian tomorrow than I am today, and so forth and so on, because I'm looking for the day where I'll be complete. Uh, I will be perfect, and uh, but not until I stand before Jesus. Uh, so it doesn't get right until then. Uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Um, Paul is emphasizing his number one priority is to preach the gospel, which without, no one would be ready to be baptized. I think that, in all honesty, if, uh, if a lot of pastors today would, would focus on this, just preach the gospel, just preach the gospel, that our churches probably would be a lot stronger. Uh, we, we get so much other stuff going on where I think maybe the, the studying and the preaching suffers. And so we want to be careful with that. And so we want to make sure that we're uh, faithful to our call and that we don't get wrapped up in some of the some of the peripheral uh, ministry of the church, and stay focused on what we have. And obviously, that's what was going on in Acts chapter six when we uh, called our first deacons, and so that the uh, uh, the disciples or the apostles could uh, maintain studying the God's word. Paul writes that Christ sent him to preach the gospel, but not with wisdom of words. This means without philosophical reasoning or secular learning. Why? lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So preaching Jesus should be enough. But we're seeing the results of this right here, where we've got guys standing in the pulpit today, they're, they're philosophers. Uh, you know, they want to talk about the social ills that's going on in the world and, you know, all these things. They're trying to, uh, you know, they're trying to uh, do a, I call it self-help preaching. Uh, you know, they're there to encourage you to like yourself, to be confident in yourself and to trust yourself and all these things, your best life now, and all this other stuff. Um, but that's not, that's not what our, our preaching should be about. Our preaching should be about the Word of God. Uh, if a person's living right, then I don't have to, I don't have to pump them up. I don't have to uh, tell them that, hey, yeah, you're really a good person. You're trying hard. The gospel will teach them that. The Bible will teach them that. 
Uh, if you go and you study and, and you work and you're doing the best you can for the Lord, uh, he'll bless you. And, uh, and the thing of it is, you know, it says that, you know, the Holy Spirit will witness with our spirit. And so we know. We, we, listen, people know when they're doing wrong. People know when they're um, not excelling like they could. I think that we sell ourselves as believers way sh too short too often because we get stuck on the idea that I can't do this rather than we and we being us and the Lord, us and the Holy Spirit, we can do anything. And so to have the ability, the faith, to trust that, that myself plus Jesus equals anything that he's got before us. We got it. Uh, if we have that kind of faith, then, then we'll see success. I personally believe that if we raise our children uh, with the love and admonition of the Lord, that those children will grow up and they will be confident. Um, they, will be, they will feel safe. Um, they will be um, uh, fearless. If they're taught to trust in the Lord and that, you know, hey, there's a Savior that loves you no matter what. We've got kids in the world today that, uh, number one, they don't have a safe environment to live in. Uh, they may not have two parents. Uh, maybe the parents they do have are addicts or whatever the case may be. Their world is very unbalanced and their world is very scary uh, from a young age up. And so they grow up and they don't trust people and all these things and, um, and they act out and, and what have you. Uh, but in a, if you raise them in a Christian home, and they see that dad loves mom and mom loves dad and there's mutual respect. There's the study of God's word. Um, dad doesn't just talk about church on Sunday. Uh, dad uh, conducts himself uh, like a Christian on, you know, on the weekday as he's engaging in, in business activities and what have you, uh, the way he interacts with other family members and what have you. Uh, that's what I think gives a, a young person uh, that sense of security uh, that they need to be confident and competent as they go through this life. Preaching Jesus, Jesus is enough. I've never been one that, um, I don't know a lot about these other religions. Uh, I know they're there. And every once in a while I'll go and scan through, a, a, I've got a couple PowerPoints on this and that. Uh, but the truth is, is that I, I'm convinced. I don't have to preach that this religion or that religion or that one is, is wrong. All I gotta do is preach that this one is right. I believe preaching Jesus will trump all of them. And so I think that that comes through. And I think that's why, you know, I was listening to someone today and they're talking about, you know, the great revival that's taking place in Iran and in China um, because of preaching Jesus. And so, um, you know, the world, don't think that the world isn't being uh, reached uh, uh, today because it is. Uh, Jesus said in John 12, 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This phrase lifted up refers to Christ's death on the cross, and the word all means Jesus' offer of salvation extends to all people, not just the Jews. It's the all that's important. Uh, and there's people out there, there's different doctrines out there about limited atonement and things of that. Now, I personally don't agree in limited atonement. I believe when he says all, he means all. Uh, I believe when he shed his blood that, he, that the intention was and uh, was that it was available to all. Uh, even though he knew that not all would uh, come to repentance. Uh, but I do believe that the offer was, was good. I believe it was valid. I don't believe he's misleading in his words at all. Uh, Jesus' incredible love for all people as expressed in, on his death on the cross will draw the, uh, the lost and uh, unify the saved. And that's the whole point. Uh, through the years, I've told people many times, I said, listen, we can have differences of opinion about this, this, and this. Uh, but when we get to the foot of the cross, we should be united on what our purpose is. The purpose of a born-again believer in Jesus Christ today, number one, is to honor and glorify God, and number two is to be a witness of Jesus Christ in, into a lost and dying world. That's what we're supposed to be about. The color of the walls, the, 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 how the structure is going to be built, whether it's brick or stucco or whatever, none of that means anything. What matters is, is that are you faithful to the call that Jesus has on your life? And so people will say, well, what's my call? Well, there, there's, there's general callings, if you will, uh, in the Bible. Uh, we're supposed to study to show ourselves worthy. Uh, we're supposed to uh, pray. Uh, we're supposed to attend church. Uh, you know, of course, don't steal, don't commit adultery, and, and don't murder, and all those things that, that we're not supposed to do. 
uh, in Acts chapter uh, 2. We're called to be a witness of Jesus Christ. So there's a, there's a whole mess of things that applies to everybody. Uh, now there's a, an individual calling, me as a pastor, uh, a deacon, uh, a trustee, a teacher, an administrator, whatever the case may be. Um, but there's a call on everybody's life. And if we would be faithful to that call, and, and the bare minimum I can give you is that you're going to be a witness. I've had so many people through the years tell me, and listen, I know, uh, I can't witness. I'm not comfortable with people. I'm not, you know, I get it. I understand. But the fact is, I don't believe that our God would require something of us that we cannot obtain. I do not believe that he would tell us to, uh, to be a witness of him and then us not be able to do it. Uh, we might not be, you know, a shining example the first time out. Um, and there's all kinds of stories out there of someone babbling through and fumbling and bumbling their words the first time they were witness to someone, but they led someone to the Lord. That was the guy that led D.L. Moody to the Lord. That was his testimony. It's probably, he said it was the worst testimony he had ever given. And, and uh, you know, but D.L., you know, the Lord had been working in his heart. And look what D.L. Moody did. Uh, you never know when the person you're going to lead to the Lord is going to be another D.L. or a Billy Graham or Billy Sunday or whoever. Um, there's great opportunities out there. If we will be faithful, the faithful part, I think through the years, you know, I, I, the way I look at it anyway is that when you're a young Christian, you hope. And by hope, I mean, yeah, you hope. You know, you're, you wonder, you know, uh, like I said before, when Peter asked Jesus if he could get out of the boat, I think he jumped over the side of the boat. Uh, I don't think he went like this. I don't think, you know, is he going to hold me? I don't think that's what he did. Uh, but I think as a new Christian, we tend to, you know, we want to just stick our toe in there and see if it's going to work like we want it to. Um, when we get the faith to where we're re ready to leap over the side of the boat and charge forward for Jesus, then uh, Jesus will make sure that uh, we're, we're blessed in that. I, again, I tell folks that I believe that if we give uh, our Lord a, a good, honest effort, our best effort, and a, and a heartfelt effort, then we'll be blessed. He will bless those efforts. It's I think what happens is that um, you can let arrogance and pride creep in, and really, you know, I've seen it. You have too, where you got people up there singing, and they're there for the applause. They're there for the self-gratification, the self-glorification uh, of their voice or their ability to play or whatever the case may be. And even in the pulpit, it's the same thing. We see that today as well. Um, but if it's a genuine, heartfelt uh, attempt to glorify God, God's honored. And, of course, that's what we want is to be able to honor him in everything that we do. Uh, we talked last week about the, um, in our sermon that uh, when we go to work, uh, we obey our masters, we obey our employers, uh, not necessarily because we like them. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a good thing if you do, but what if they're a bad boss? Well, you still uh, honor them, you still submit to their authority because why? For, for the good of the Lord, because that's God's command is that we're supposed to be obedient to our masters. And in doing that, we glorify him. So again, we got to keep self out of the equation because when we bring self in, then we get ourselves in trouble uh, because we lose all sight of what we're supposed to be doing. So, questions, comments. Striving for unity. Uh, listen, you know, we've been talking all year about being intentional uh, with God. And I think this is one of the areas where it, it truly applies. That when we feel ourselves, I don't know, maybe our temper spurning up a little bit there. Uh, we need to take a breath and say, okay, I'm commanded. Uh, you know, to, to keep us together, to, uh, that the body of Christ should be unified. And so we want to work towards that and, and put our best efforts towards it as well.